What's up? Oh, first thing is I got replies for my stupid questions. I understand what's going on. So if you're getting close price, get close price history today. So this morning, I obviously can't get close price for today. So I have a window length of two. I get the close price from yesterday and the day before yesterday. And then my other question. And they basically said, look at the GitHub. That's what we did anyway. Should I say thank you? That would be a British thing to do. Maybe thanks. You know, it's more more informal, more chill. Right, so what were we doing, lads? So what we did is we just finished this thing. We got our factor, which is our moving averages thing. And we got some returns data from Quantopian pipeline. We shifted that data around a bit and moved it into a pandas data frame. And the reason we shifted it around is to do with um, that window length stuff I was just, just talking about. Alpha lens want forward returns as an input. So that's basically the return you will get rather than the return you got. And then we create a factor tear sheet to analyze our momentum factor. So this is what we're doing today. Trying to understand what all this stuff means. So one of the things we did when we called get clean factor is um, set the quantiles to five. So that splits uh, the data into five equally sized groups that have a range of values. And what this is showing you is our factor has some values. And in the range of minus 6.14 to minus 0.168, there's 20% of the samples in there, which corresponds to 150,000. And I suppose that's across all the equities we were looking at. It's your standard deviation. It's a measure of the spread of the values. Could show you how to calculate standard deviation, but it's pretty boring. Just get someone else to do it. Get an intern to do it. So this is annual alpha. So if you would plot returns of the market, some baseline like the S&P 500 or the FTSE or something, you plot the returns of that on X and you plot the returns of your trading system on Y. Draw a straight line through those. And the Y offset is alpha. So basically how much better are you than the market and the beta is the gradient of that straight line but let's just confirm that is the case there's so many things called alpha and beta that's what i said lads just a problem with having a curve here if you you kept extrapolating this way so if the market was going down then your slope might cross the y-axis cross the x-axis and go into negative return territory but what you want is your algorithm to perform really well at all times so you want basically zero beta if you can and some positive alpha. The reason I know that is because I watched Coursera course on it. I mean, this is some techno babble, isn't it? BPS, I think, is basis points. Now, basis points, it's just a really intimidating way to say 0.01%. So our top quantile things get 0.35 hundredths of a percent return. And then the bottom quantile loses 0.5 thousandths on average day to day. Okay, this is just the difference between those two things. So it's the absolute difference between these things. So yeah, I don't know if it's good or bad to have a big spread or not at the moment. There's the same data on a bar chart. Now this has got some blobs. What kind of chart is this? It's not a candlestick, more like a spinning top. Oh, spinning top is actually a thing. Okay, so it's not that. I don't know, blobby charts? It looks like normal distributions, doesn't it? If you look at these curves. So it's a measure of distribution, isn't it? The kind of peak, peak width of the blob is ab above the return equals zero line. So that means, on average, you're, you're getting a positive return. There's your cumulative return. So we're not really making any money. Quantile 1 makes the least money, and quantile 5 makes the most money. But past returns doesn't equal future performance, lads. I see. I already don't know what that means. Integrated circuit, of course. Information coefficient. Ooh, it's the degree to which your factor predicts the uh, return. So our factor has a small amount of predictive power, but I don't know what a good value is. It's the variance in your IC score over time. Now they've got a risk adjusted information coefficient. Uh, it's just the mean divided by the standard deviation. It penalizes you for standard deviation by putting it in the denominator. You don't want volatility in your returns because it makes people nervous. You just want it to go up every day. No worries. And the next thing is a t-test to one samp. I don't like statistical tests. So two distributions and you try to figure out 
if the difference in their means is significant. So I think we have the same number of samples in each in each distribution, which is market returns and factor returns. So let me use this equal variance t test, which is used when the number of samples in each group is the same. It's a difference in means divided by a kind of normalized sum of variances. So it penalizes uh, variance, which makes sense because if you have a lot of variance, your distributions are more likely to overlap. Uh, so that's T. And what about P value? So in this example, you calculate the T, you calculate degrees of freedom, which is um, some sum of the number of records you got, number of samples, something like that. You take that, take your T value, you look it up in a table, it gives you a number, then you compare your T value against that number. But instead of doing that, this is giving you the equivalent P value. And so this is quite high, 0.287. It basically means it's quite likely your distributions are the same. You want this to be something like 5% or less, so 0.05 or less. Not gonna lie, I, I really don't like hypothesis testing. So there's some more information coefficient things. There's the skew and the kurtosis. These are not too complicated. The skew is a measure of how, how bent the normal distribution is, or perhaps it's skewness. It's a measure of asymmetry. There's a little bit of negative skew on the information coefficient. Negative skew indicates the tail is on the left side of the distribution. I suppose we've got a little bit more tail here, but it's pretty subtle, isn't it? Then we have to remember the mean is slightly ahead of zero. And the kurtosis. It's a measure of the tailiness. Basically, the higher it is, the spikier it is. So these are all some probability distributions with different values of ketosis. But the high value gives you the spiky spike, and the low value gives you the uh, the blocky block. So we're saying it's a little bit spiky, and it's a little bit skewed. And now the graphs. So we've got the information coefficient plotted, and we're doing a one month moving average on it. But it generally wobbles around zero, doesn't it? I guess there's a little bit more above than below. And yeah, distribution of IC over time. And finally, what have we got here? Normal distribution QQ. So if you take your data, you calculate your mean, standard deviation, or variance, and then plot that on, on the X. But this time, it's just in terms of quantiles again. And then there's the observed quantile. So in a perfect normal distribution with loads of samples, you would get a nice straight line. Your dots would just fill up this line and it'd be all nice and good. But the real world, you know, things aren't perfect normal distributions. So when you plot your real data, it's slightly off the red line. This QQ plot take into account skew and stuff. Oh, so you can you can see the skew in it, and uh, we got a bit of skew that way, so we get a bit of whoop. And if we skew that way, we get a bit of whoop. And we've got a bit of, well, we've barely got anything, have we? Ours barely does anything. Maybe does just a little bit. So negative skew. It's got a little bit of negative skew. It's kind of doing a little bit of a bender. So that's consistent with this at least. We just want to make money with probability one. We don't want to be messing about with uh, statistics. So I think that's it. Step four we can't do because I don't have any friends. But um, if you want to comment, you know, any horrible mistakes I've made in explaining things, that'd be appreciated. Almost there, lads. It's a one-way ticket to wealth. Let's go.